see what happens in materials. Uh, and it's really one of the most important results for materials um, is, is how the band structure that we saw in the last lecture fits in with, um, with Fermi surfaces. Okay, so let me just review what, what we saw in the last lecture. And, and, and the key was this picture here. Everything you need to know from the last lecture is, is in this. So this is the energy versus momentum. If there was no lattice, this would be quadratic. And the lattice does um, really two things. Firstly, it gives rise to gaps in the, in the energy. So the gaps you can see here, and here, and here. And um, these gaps appear at very special values of the momentum, which on the one-dimensional lattice is pi over a, and 2 pi over a, and 3 pi over a, and, and so on. And um, uh, the, uh, the other thing that's worth noticing, which I didn't really stress in the last lecture, but as you get close to the gap, you can see that to form the gap, the energy bends down a little bit here. And as you come this way, it bends up a little bit here. So of course, it, it has to do that just because it can't be quadratic. So in the middle, it's sort of following roughly this quadratic form. But when you get to the gaps, it either bends down or it, it bends up. Okay? So they're really the, the facts that are going to be important um, as we proceed in, in this lecture. All right, so, so what is this? This is the energy for a single electron, excuse me, uh, moving in a lattice. And uh, that's very unrealistic, because in a material, we don't have one electron. We have many, many, many electrons. Typically, in a material, there's something like 10 to the 23 electrons. And so what we want to do in, <coughs> in, uh, in this lecture is try to understand uh, what happens when you throw in 10 to the 23 electrons, each of which has this sort of uh, energy spectrum. Okay, so that's where we're going. Um, let me uh, firstly, um, and if you've seen Fermi levels and, uh, uh, and Fermi energies, this is an old story, but let me firstly just remind you what happens if you don't have any lattice. So we're going to consider the following situation. You, you take a box, the box is completely empty, and what I'm going to do is start throwing in one electron, and then another electron, and then another electron, and I want to ask, what's the ground state of this system when you have lots and lots of electrons there? Okay, so we know what the, what the answer is for just one electron, and then we want to build up and think of, of lots of them. All right, firstly, let, let's think about one again. So the, um, uh, the energy of uh, a single particle, we've seen this formula so many times, it's, uh, um, it's momentum squared on the top divided by 2m. I'm now going to be in three dimensions, so the momentum can go in the x, y, and z direction, which I've called k1, k2, and, and k3. Okay? And the purpose of putting this in a box is, is um, to make life easy for ourselves. When you're in a box, you can't have any momentum. You can only have momentum that gives an integer number of wavelengths in, in the wave function. So what that means is that the momentum ki, or the wave number ki, has to be 2 pi over l times some integer little n. Okay? And... Uh, um, yeah, this is all we need to know for a single particle. So now we're going to do the following. We're going to start throwing in lots of electrons, like I said, and we're going to make some assumptions. Um, and some of these assumptions are good assumptions, and some of these assumptions are absolutely terrible assumptions. So th these are the assumptions. The, the first one isn't really an assumption. The first one is simply a fact. It's that every electron uh, comes in two different types. It's got spin up or spin down, okay, because the electron has, has a spin. That's the good assumption because it's simply true. Uh, the next assumption is the one that's terrible. The next assumption is, is the idea that these electrons don't interact with each other at all. Okay? Now, you know it's a terrible assumption. You know it's a terrible assumption because there's a Coulomb repulsive force between, between electrons. The force is very, very strong. It's at least as strong as all the other energy levels or uh, energy uh, scales in the game. So it's not a good approximation to just uh, neglect this completely. Nonetheless, that's what we're going to do as, as we move forward. Okay? I, should, I, I should say right now, a lot of the biggest open problems in condensed matter physics are to do with what happens when you put that cool, Coulomb repulsion back in. For some things we understand it, for many things we, we just have no idea whatsoever. So it's a very, very hard problem to repeat this with the, um, uh, with the electrons in. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens, actually, that we know about. But in general, it's just, just not solved. All right, so, so they're the, the, the good assumption and the bad assumption, and now we need a, a principle of physics before we move on. Um, and, and the principle is the following. Firstly, you need to know that, fer that electrons are fermions, and there's something called the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that fermions cannot occupy the same state. So if you've got one fermion sitting there, you don't get to get put another fermion there. It has to sit next door. 
Okay? So with this, this is all we need just to build up and, and understand what happens. So, so what does happen? Um, we're going to take that box and we're going to throw in electrons and we want to ask what's the lowest energy state that these electrons can sit in. Okay? And we know that the, that the energy is proportional to the, uh, the momentum these electrons have. Okay. Uh, the first electron is very easy. The first electron can sit in the state with zero momentum and let's say it has a spin up. So it doesn't cost you any energy at all. You just put in an electron and it, it sits there. Okay, that's very good. The next one can also sit with zero momentum, but it has to have spin down, so it's the opposite to the first one because that's a different quantum state. Okay, so you, you get to put two electrons in for free that don't cost you any, any energy at all. All right, now the third electron. The third electron is going to cost you something because the third electron can't sit in any of those two zero energy states, so it has to have some momentum, has to have some speed, and the smallest momentum it can have because we have this quantization condition, is a momentum 2 pi over L. So this momentum costs, sorry, this electron costs you 2 pi over L squared times h bar squared divided by 2m. And again, you get to choose whether it's spin up or spin down. Okay? So we put the third electron in, it costs you some momentum. Let's say the momentum is in the x direction with spin up. Next one is in the y direct, is in the x direction with spin down. Next one's in the x direction with spin up. So I just say all this again. X direction with spin up, X direction with spin down, Y direction with spin up, Y direction with spin down, Z direction with spin up, Z direction with spin down. Okay, so you get, get six electrons, all of which cost you the same energy. Okay? Then we go to the next one. Now that energy level is no longer uh, free, so now we have to excite two units of momentum in one of the three directions, and you can either be spin up or, or spin down. So you get this nice combinatoric problem where at each energy level, uh, you have to figure out how many different ways there are of putting electrons in there, and then you get to fill out that number of electrons. And then you have to build up to, to the next number. Okay. It's very, very similar to what happens for, um, for atoms. You know, for atoms, you have these, these shells of, of angular momentum, and each shell can have an electron up or electron down, and it would give rise to the, uh, the structure in the periodic table. So even without a nucleus there, it's the same sort of story. Now, they're not... Um, these quantum states aren't states in space, they're smeared in space, but they're states in, in having different levels of momentum. Okay? So this is the picture that you get. You keep throwing electrons in, and each electron has to have, after some time, a higher momentum, and therefore a higher energy. So you start filling out the available momentum states, all spin up or, or spin down. Okay? So by the time you've thrown in 10 to the 23 electrons, you've got a very large... Um, uh, momentum that the last electron has, and you've filled out this ball in momentum space. It's, n it's really important to get this right. It's not a ball that's sitting there in your box of electrons. The electrons fill everything in the box because they're smeared with wave functions that, that exist everywhere. But if you go to momentum space, in momentum space they fill out a ball. Okay? Is this good with people? Yeah, people come across this, this concept before. Not so much. No. Yeah. yeah, you have. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, so, so this, this is the kind of uh, picture that you get for the ground state of an electron, but as I keep stressing, in momentum space, not in real space. Okay? Um, and as, pe as people have mentioned already, everything to do with this is called Fermi something. So let me give you some, um, uh, some, some names. What sits inside is called the Fermi C. So the Fermi C consists of all quantum states that are filled because they've got an electron sitting there. Okay? The edge of this ball is called the Fermi surface. The uh, momentum of the, of the electrons that sit on the Fermi surface is called the Fermi momentum. And the energy of those electrons is called the Fermi energy. And there's probably about 100 other things that are called Fermi something, but anything to do with this is called Fermi something. So the Fermi level that people mentioned already, that's the same thing as the Fermi energy. When you hear the word Fermi level, it's the level of the energy of the last electron that, that you put in, which is roughly the same as the energy that the next electron you put in has to have as, as well. Okay. Are we happy? Yeah. Good. Um, th this is the single most important fact you... Uh, Actually, this is the first important fact you need to know. There's going to be two. This is the important one. Um, everything that happens in a material happens on the edge of this Fermi surface. 
Okay? So, so let, let me explain why this is. This is the ground state of the system. This is what happens if you just throw in the electrons and let them relax to their, their lowest state. But now suppose I go and do something to this material, where doing something can be anything at all. I could kick it, or I could uh, hold a cigarette lighter underneath it and, and heat it up, or I could put a current uh, over it. So everything I do changes the material in some way, and what we want to ask as physicists is how the material reacts to, to what I'm doing. Okay? Now, it can react in various ways. The lattice can deform, and we're not going to discuss this. Um, but here, what we're interested in is how the electrons react. And in particular, if, if you, you know, get some rusty crocodile clips and put them on, on either side and uh, drop a voltage across, it's only the electrons that react and will conduct electricity in, in the material. So what I'm saying is really most important for electricity conduction. So, so what happens? The electrons are going to respond in some way, and they're going, to, they're going to move, and electrons move by shifting themselves to a different energy level. Okay. So there's lots and lots of electrons here. There's 10 to the 23 electrons. But those that are sitting deep inside just don't have anywhere to move to. You know, the, the energy that's required to shift from here outside here is absolutely huge. You know, it's an enormous shift for those electrons. So they just don't, don't have anywhere to go. Okay? Let, let, me, let me give you some... See if I can remember some numbers. Yeah, you, I think you have to heat these things up to about 10,000 Kelvin. To, to shift electrons from there to the outside. So it's huge energies that are involved, huge temperatures that are involved to, to shift those electrons. The ones that can move, and therefore the only ones that actually do anything in a, in, a, in a material, are those on the outside. Because those on the outside are the last filled electrons, and so by definition they have empty states just a little bit of energy away. Okay? So if you want to understand the way electrons move in, in materials, it doesn't matter what's going on on the inside. None of that's important. All of the physics is to do with what's going on with the Fermi surface. And so the properties of the Fermi surface and those electrons that are sitting on those surface that are going to tell you anything that, that you want, want to know about how electrons conduct heat, about how electrons conduct electricity, about what happens in magnetic fields, uh, all of this is to do with the properties of the Fermi surface. That's why it's important. It's the, it's the thing that governs everything. All right. Any questions about, about this? Yeah, please. Uh, we are talking about uh, electrons in a box or in general? Sorry. So at the moment we're in a box, but this last point holds for, for everything I'm going to say from now on. So it holds for all materials. It's the electrons on the Fermi surface that, that are interesting. Yes. Sorry, I seem to shout. Then yes, that, that's that, that, that's right. The, the reason is the following: it's because um, it's because the box has a finite size, and so it's it's, it's one of the, the problems you do in the first time you meet quantum mechanics. Is a particle in a box. You remember, and and the box you think of as having infinite potential here, and the wave functions are, are causes and signs, but you can only fit in an integer number of those uh, th th those wave numbers. That that rings a bell. Good. So in, in general, what happens is, is for the box, um, these, particles have, um, these particles have discrete momentum. And for a material, that's true because the material has some finite size. So the particles also in a material have some finite momentum. Yeah, discrete momentum. Other questions? All right. Um, so this is what we need to know about, about Fermi surfaces. And now we're going to combine this idea with the idea that we saw in the previous lecture. Okay? So what was the idea that we saw in the previous lecture? It was that um, the energy states, when you have a lattice, aren't nice and continuous, but there are these gaps. Okay? So what we're going to do is start throwing in electrons, many electrons, still assuming that they don't interact with each other. And uh, we'll see what happens as they start to pile up and fill more and more energy states. Okay, that, that's where we're going. Um, before we go there, I, I'm actually just going to backtrack a little bit um, and, and tell you um, how this changes when you add interactions. So uh, this is sort of an aside that, that I'm not going to um, give any details on, but I think it's worth you knowing. So uh, remember, the assumption was that there were no interactions between electrons. And I said it's a completely horrible assumption that just um, uh, isn't true at all in the real world. Um, 
The reason it's important is because the Pauli exclusion principle no longer makes sense when you have interactions. Because the Pauli exclusion principle is a statement about individual electrons sitting in one electron states. And as soon as you put in uh, new electrons, all of those energy states start to change around. And so you have to sort of think of a more general, and there's a generalized version of Pauli exclusion, but as it's usually stated, it really needs three electrons rather than interacting electrons. So all of the physics becomes, sorry, I should say this, this differently, all of the calculations you have to do are very, very different, but the remarkable fact is this remains exactly the same when you turn on interactions. Now, it, it takes, um, well, it took about 20 years for people to show that, and it takes a very, very long course in advanced condensed matter physics to prove it, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's a true statement. So the person that figured this out is a guy called uh, Landau, and the theory of interacting fermions is called the Landau-Fermi liquid theory. Um, Fermi didn't do it, but, but Landau did. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting and very beautiful theory, but you know, all you really need to know is that this actually is what happens in the real world, albeit for rather complicated uh, reasons. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, so let, let's return to, um, to our lattice. So um, we have uh, the energy spectrum like this with the gaps, and we're going to start throwing in electrons. Um, th this becomes a little bit tricky to show graphically. You see, it's very easy to show the energy spectrum uh, in a one-dimensional lattice, but things become very boring if I start throwing electrons into a one-dimensional lattice. And things are much more interesting for two-dimensional and three-dimensional materials. So what we're going to have to do in our minds is picture this here, but in two dimensions. Okay? Now, I don't have the PowerPoint skills, and I probably don't have the artistic skills, but I'm going to try and just draw this on the board. Okay? So... Um, what, what's going on? We, we're going to have two dimensions, and this is always in momentum space, remember? So this is going to be momentum in the x direction, and this is going to be momentum in the y direction. So this is kx, and this is ky. And so the momentum can take anything on this plane, but the plane is parceled up into Brillouin zones. That's the analog of this. Okay? So let me draw the first Brillouin zone. Here it's a, an interval. In two dimensions, it's going to be a square. So here is the first Brillouin zone. So this is Kx is pi over A. This is minus pi over A. This is Ky and so on. This is the origin. Okay? And then I want to think about the energy of an electron moving in this. It's going to go with K squared, Kx squared plus Ky squared. So it's going, this is going to be the energy up here. E of K. So it's roughly speaking going to come up as a quadratic parabola-like thing. Okay? So I need to draw that. However, when you get to the edges of the Brillouin zone, it's going to bend over. So what's it going to look like? Above here, above this point, it's going to be there, and then it's going to dip down to zero, and then up to here. And, but as I go along here, it's not going to be constant, because this corner is further away than this. So as I come along this surface here above, it's going to dip. Okay. And now I need to do that in the other directions as well. So there's going to be a dip, and a dip, and a dip. All right. It looks a bit rubbish. But you sort of get the, 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 the vague picture. It's like a, a badly made vase. Yes, please. It's like a gravy boat. It's like a what? A gravy boat. A gravy boat. Yeah. Is it? I don't know what a gravy boat is. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks it's like a gravy boat? Yeah, it's just you, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so, so it's like this, and then there's an energy gap, and, um, and then it sort of goes again, and I'm just really going to fail to, to do this. So there's a gap above every point, and then it, off it goes again. In. Okay, see it? All right, it's probably not helping, but did you get a sense of what this energy, energy looks like? Okay. So, so given this, we're now going to start throwing electrons in, and they're going to start filling up this energy level. Okay? So, so what do we do? Firstly, let, let's suppose um, that we don't have any lattice at all, but nonetheless I put the Brillouin zone there, that in two dimensions they just fill out a circle. Okay? So that what was a Fermi ball before becomes a Fermi disk, a 
and the Fermi surface is just the edge of, of this circle. Okay? But what does the lattice do? The lattice means that when you're close to the edge of the Brillouin zone, the energy gets pushed down a little bit, and therefore the electrons that you throw in will preferentially want to go close to the edge of the Brillouin zone because that's where the energy is, is lower. So as you throw in more and more electrons, sorry, I said that incorrectly, as you increase the strength of the lattice, this Fermi surface will get distorted and um, it wants to be, it doesn't want to be circular, instead it wants to get closer to the edge of, of the Brillouin zone. So this is close to the edge, this is further from the edge, so it, it, it comes in here and it, it bulges out there. Okay? And if you distort it more and more, what happens is um, at some point the Fermi surface actually wants to hit the edge of the Brillouin zone. Um, it doesn't go past the edge of the Brillouin zone because there's a gap. It's going to cost a lot more energy to, to go here than here, but uh, this is the kind of picture that, that we would expect in very strong lattices. All right. Is, is, this, is this vaguely clear? Yeah, any questions about, about this? All right, so, so this is what we expect on general grounds, given just uh, Fermi surfaces and what we did yesterday. And now we can just go and look at the, at the, at the data. Um, in fact, there's a lovely website. It's, it's this website here. This website has a periodic table and every single element. You get to click on it, and it shows you what the Fermi surface looks like, which has been done both experimentally, and I can tell you how you measure Fermi surfaces later, if you like, and using uh, some pretty detailed calculations. Um, and here's two examples. Here's uh, uh, lithium. The Fermi surface uh, should be a sphere if there was no lattice, but the lattice distorts it a little bit, and it distorts it in exactly the way that we thought, so it sort of bulges where it's closer to the, the edge of the Brillouin zone. Uh, and this is copper. So for copper, the, the lattice is much stronger, and the Fermi surface gets distorted so much that it comes out and it hits the edge of, um, of the Brillouin zone. All right. So, so there's some interesting things here. In particular, copper has a different topology of its Fermi surface than, uh, than lithium does. There's, there's places where you can sort of spin around and, and can't get out. So there's interesting things that, that happen because of this. All right. Um, what happens if we keep going, however? So this was everything within the first Brillouin zone. Suppose you start to throw in more electrons. Well, at some point, it, see, it costs... A, Though it's not obvious here, it costs a big amount of energy to jump from just inside to just outside the Brillouin zone, because that's going up this gap here. So um, eventually, however, if you keep throwing in, um, the electrons will spill over and they'll go into the second Brillouin zone. Okay? So th this, as I've drawn it, is what would happen with no lattice at all, but just with the Brillouin zone marked. Um, if you include a Brillouin zone, again, this gets distorted, and it looks more like this, if you include the lattice interactions. But if you make the lattice strong enough, what happens is the following. You see, as I've drawn it here, this point, which is in the second Brillouin zone, costs less energy than this point in the first Brillouin zone. So as I've drawn it here, this electrons would rather sit here than here, so this bit fills up before the, the end of the first. That's what's going on here. This bit fills up before this corner fills up. Okay? But if the lattice gets stronger and stronger, eventually this gap gets bigger, and this point becomes higher than this point. So in that case, you fill up all of the first Brillouin zone and none of the second Brillouin zone. Okay? And that looks like, like the following. Okay? So what, what's going on here? Um, there's a big, big difference between these two and this one. And the big difference is the following. These two have a Fermi surface. So what's a Fermi surface? A Fermi surface is electron states where there are nearby empty electron states. Okay? And you can see that this has them. This has them here. This, uh, so both of these correspond in some way. Okay? This, where the chunk of energy is equal to the, uh, the gap that's here. Okay? So we have names for materials like this and materials like this. Materials like this we call metals, and materials like this we call insulators. Okay? It, it, it's, it's really, I think, one of the wonderful facts of, of science. We learn when we're babies, maybe not babies, but soon afterwards, that materials come in two different types. 
there are things called metals that conduct electricity and there are things called insulators that don't conduct electricity. And it's one of these childlike questions. Why should it be like that? Wouldn't you just think if you know, all the different materials in the world, you'd have uh, just a gradation, things that conduct electricity really well, a little better, a little worse, a little worse, a little worse, and there'd just be a continuum of materials with different conductivities and, and resistivities. But that's not the way it works in nature. Materials are either really, really good conductors, you get gaps in the spectrum, and the second thing is the Pauli exclusion principle, which means you have to fill up uh, um, consecutively, the electrons can't sit, sit in the same state. So it's one of these very, very simple things that we've known about for many, many centuries, but we only understood when we finally understood quantum mechanics. And it's not usually sold as such. Usually when we learn quantum mechanics, we're told you know, the wonders of the periodic table and atoms and, and, and things like this. This is just as important. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's like a periodic table, but for tw 10 to the 23 uh, electrons. OK, any questions? Um, no, there's a dependence on something which I, I, I'm about to tell you, but it's not that, yeah, the type of lattice is not what's important. The type of atom in the lattice is for a reason I'll, I'll explain next. Yeah. By the way, there's, there's a nice story here. Um, I bet you a hundred pounds no one knows who discovered this. <laughs> you know, I've asked this in so many places and no one ever knows who discovered this. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you um, before anybody... Um, it's a guy called Alan Wilson and no one has ever heard of Alan Wilson so this is Alan Wilson's story Alan Wilson was a PhD student in Cambridge under a guy called Ralph Fowler did quite well for himself and got a postdoc to work with Heisenberg so he went to work with Heisenberg and uh, with Heisenberg's help I should say made this discovery that quantum mechanics underlies one of those basic principles in, that we've known about in, in science um, and then he went back to Cambridge uh, and told the Cambridge professors, who were people like Rutherford and Dirac and Mott, I really sort of, you know, some of the great physicists of the 20th century, um, what he discovered. He was very, very excited, and none of them cared. They basically told him he was wasting his time, that the interesting physics was, um, was nuclear physics or particle physics, and this kind of nonsense just wasn't, wasn't interesting at all. But there's a famous quote by Rutherford. Rutherford says, um, uh, science is either physics or butterfly collecting, uh, by which he meant physics when you understand things and butterfly collecting is just, just a collection of facts. Um, and what he really meant was, was physics is, or science is either the kind of physics he does, nuclear physics, or butterfly collecting. Anything like this, he just, he didn't care at all. So, so Wilson got very despondent. He, he, uh, he wrote a book on this um, and then he left physics. He quit because, um, even though he made one of the great discoveries of the 20th century, um, because... Um, you know, the people he cared about didn't appreciate uh, his work. So I, th I think there's a moral here. If you think you've made one of the great breakthroughs in all of science, you, you probably haven't, but, you know, you should have some confidence in yourself anyway. You should push forward and neglect, just don't listen to everything that your superiors tell you, because they're not always right. Okay, um, so, so this is the difference between metals and, uh, and insulators. Um, but it seems rather miraculous. It seems miraculous for the following reason. To get an insulator seems infinitely improbable because you only get an insulator if you have exactly the right number of electrons in your material to fill one Brillouin zone. Okay? If I have exactly one more electron, then it has to sit outside here because there's no space for it inside. And as soon as it sits outside here, that one extra electron is quite happy to move around freely. Uh, it's got as many uh, empty states as it likes. So there has to be this miraculous coincidence that somehow the number of electrons in the material is exactly the right number to fill the first Brillouin zone, and not any less and not any more, because if there were less or more, there'd be empty electron states that electrons could move into when you, you perturb them in, in some way. Okay? So it would seem, without knowing anything more, that you could never get uh, insulators. It's just very, very improbable that there would be this, this coincidence. But thankfully, nature does something rather nice. So, so let me explain why, um, as you know, insulators exist in, uh, in the real world. Okay, so, so what, what happens? Um, as I said before, to get an insulator, um, not only does the lattice have to be strong enough so that the gap is big, so that everything sits here, um, but the number of electrons in this has to be exactly equal to the number of quantum states. Okay? Now, we did this calculation in the last lecture. 
the number of quantum states in the first Brillouin zone is exactly equal to the number of electrons that sits in the lattice. And in the last lecture, we did it just for the one-dimensional lattice. We had a lattice with n electrons, capital N electrons, and we counted the number of states in the first Brillouin zone to be n. It turns out this is a result that is general, that the number of quantum states in each Brillouin zone, in particular in the first one, is always equal to the number of atoms that exists in your system, which I'm going to call capital N. Okay? Now, um, remember that there's actually a factor of two that's important. Electrons come with spin up and spin down. So there's N quantum states here. That means um, that the first Brillouin zone com can accommodate N electrons of spin up and N electrons of spin down. In other words, it can accommodate two n electrons in, in general. Okay? So to fill up a, a Brillouin zone, you need twice, you need the number of electrons to be twice the number of atoms in your system. Okay? Any questions about this? Good. So what happens in materials? Um, what happens is, is rather nice. Every single atom which exists in your material uh, is, is rather different. It's one of the atoms of the periodic table. But it has a property that's called the valency. And the valency is the same as this valency that you've heard if, if you've done chemistry. It's the number of electrons which sort of sit loosely uh, bound to the atom in the outer shells that the atom is happy to get rid of. Happy to get rid of in chemical reactions. It's also happy to get rid of if you, uh, when they sit in lattices in, in solids. So what happens is every atom in your solid has a valency Z, and Z is an integer, and when the atom sits in the solid, it keeps most of ele its electrons, but it throws out some number Z of electrons, and it's those electrons which are the ones that are roaming around inside the lattice that we've been talking about so far. Okay. So if uh, you make a lattice of atoms with valency Z, then each atom donates Z electrons, which move through the material, where Z is an integer. And the total number of electrons inside the solid, which are roaming around, is N times Z, where N is the number of atoms. Okay? So there's this, this wonderful coincidence that the number of electrons moving inside your solid is an integer number of the number of atoms inside your solid. And that, that's exactly what we need. So uh, what we can do now is uh, go to our chemistry textbooks and our chemist friends will tell you the valency of any atom that, that you care about. They'll tell you how many electrons an atom will happily give up. And from that we can figure out what kind of material these, these objects will make. So it's quite nice. It's a link between chemistry and between sort of material science. So here's some examples. Um, uh, the two I showed you earlier, lithium and copper, have uh, a valency of Z equals 1. That means that each atom donates one electron. So the number of electrons moving in the solid is equal to the number of atoms in the solid. So um, there's exactly n electrons, and n electrons will fill exactly half of the first Brillouin zone. Okay? Because of the degeneracy in spin, the factor of two in spin. So in other words, any single material with Z equals one, here's a prediction, has to be a metal. And it's more or less true that every single material with Z equals 1 is a metal that conducts electricity very well because the electrons fill up exactly half of, of the Brillouin zone. Okay. Everything I'm about to say here is almost true. Um, things are almost true because I'm neglecting interactions. And sometimes the interactions become very important and it turns out there are various materials with Z equals 1 which actually are insulators and not metals. Uh, basically because of the repulsive force between electrons. They're called Mott insulators, if, if you care. Mott won the Nobel Prize for, for understanding this. All right. Um, what about... So, so, ah, so okay, I'm going to walk you through with, uh, with this picture. So this is Z equals 1, and I've just filled up half of that first green one zone. Okay. Uh, what about Z equals 2? Well, for Z equals 2, there's different options. If you have um, a weak lattice where this point here in the second Brillouin zone is lower than this point here in the first, then what happens is, although the number of electrons could perfectly fill up this second Brillouin zone, they don't. They spill over into here and leave these corners empty. Okay? 
So materials with Z equals 2 with a weak lattice could be metals where the Fermi surface is little pockets here and here. And here's an example. This is the Fermi surface for beryllium. Beryllium is a, is a metal with Z equals 2. And because the lattice is weak, uh, you still get these pockets of Fermi surfaces which can conduct electricity. But as you crank up the strength of the lattice, it's the materials with valency 2 um, which fill up exactly the first Brillouin zone, and these will be insulators. And that's also true if you look at the sort of insulators made of pure atoms, things like diamond, uh, the valency is such uh, exactly an even number of, um, of Brillouin zones. All right, and then we keep going. For Z equals 3, you fill up this one completely and half of the next one. For Z equals 4, you may or may not fill up this one. For Z equals 5, you fill up this plus this plus half of this, um, and so on and so on. So there's this uh, alternating sequence between metals and in things that may be insulators uh, as you move up. So j just some names for you. Um, the filled band is called the valence band, and the band where things can move around because it's, it's half empty is called the conduction band. So it's a useful terminology to know. Okay, any questions about, about this? So th this, this, I think, is um, yeah, two important facts. I think maybe the most, two most important facts in condensed matter physics. Actually, let me include one from the last lecture. Three most important facts in condensed matter physics. Number one, you get gaps in the spectrum. Number two, all the interesting dynamics in a material happens because of the electrons on the Fermi surface. And number three, uh, when you fill up a Brillouin zone completely, there is no Fermi surface because there are no electrons that have nearby um, empty states. And so that's why you get insulators. All right. Any questions about this? How am I doing for time? All good? Yes, please. Uh, the Fermi surface is related to the uh, Brillouin zone? Yeah, the Fermi surface lives within a Brillouin zone. But the key point, let me go back to here. Um, so, so where are the Fermi surfaces? In this one, the Fermi surface is this bit, and it's this bit. Let me do use my finger. The Fermi surface is here, and it's here. But this is not part of the Fermi surface. And the reason it's not part of the Fermi surface is because if you're an electron here, there's no empty states nearby with, um, uh, with, with energy similar to yours. It looks like the nearest state is here, but it's exactly on the edge of the Brillouin zone you get that big gap. So if you're this electron, it's going to take you a lot of energy to jump to this state. So in particular, in this picture here, there's no Fermi surface. Okay? So in insulators, there's no Fermi surface, and it's because the, the electrons go up to the edge of the Brillouin zone. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. So there's too many electrons to fully, uh, to fully fill the first use yeah. of the Brillouin zone. How many electrons for the system? 2n in every Brillouin zone. 2n. Yeah. So I didn't prove that yesterday, but it's, a, it's something you can show quite straightforwardly. 2n in every Brillouin zone. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Um, let me tell you something which uh, relates to what Hans was talking about um, uh, yesterday. Let's take an insulator. So an insulator, as we've seen, is where there's no nearby modes for the electrons to move to. But let's throw in a lot of energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one electron in this filled band, and we're going to throw in enough energy to excite it up to the next band. Okay? So uh, the electron obviously moves up to here, but when it moves up, it leaves behind a hole. So there's an empty space where it was, the, where there's no longer an electron. Okay? So, so what happens? Um, well, the electron is now free to move around. It's free to move around because there are energy states nearby that it can, it can go to. So this is obviously just a particle in the material that's free to, to move as quantum mechanics. The wonderful thing is that this is also a new particle in the material that's free to wander around. Okay? It's, it's a rather zen-like idea, but the absence of something is also something. So not having an object there means you're missing something, and the place where the electron is missing, the hole, 
itself can jump to other energy states. So what's really happening is you have a hole here, and the nearby, a nearby electron might jump into that hole, but that also looks as if the hole has jumped from here to here. Okay? And if another electron jumps into this one, it looks like the hole has jumped from, from here to here. So the absence of the electron acts itself as a new particle, and in condensed matter physics, we call this particle a hole. And because this has charge minus, this, it turns out, acts as if it has charge plus. So there is a way to have in materials, you only make these, these objects out of electrons, but there's a way to have things that appear to have positive charge moving inside these materials that, that are called holes. So condensed matter physicists call these electrons and holes. There's a very similar idea that happens in in particle physics. Remember I said yesterday, the same ideas appear over and over again in different guises in, in physics. Things that happen in condensed matter physics also happen in particle physics. And the analogy in particle physics is what we call antimatter. So the way of, one way of thinking about antimatter is very, very similar to this. In fact, the way Dirac first thought about this is, is, uh, is, is similar to this, where this object here um, uh, uh, you know, it looks very much like a positron or an, an anti-electron. Okay? It's not the same thing. That, that's worth stressing. It's an analogy where the maths looks similar, but it's not the same thing. In particular, the energy it takes to excite an electron in a material and create an electron whole pair is um, yeah, a few fractions of, a, of an electron volt. Okay? The energy it takes to uh, do the same thing in the vacuum of space and create a matter-antimatter is uh, one million electron volts. So they're very, very different energy scales, but the underlying concept is very similar. Okay. Another way of saying it, they're both MeV, but one the M is small and one the M is big. Okay. All right. Another way in which they're different is this isn't related to special relativity. This happens without needing the Dirac equation and without needing um, uh, the, the ideas of particle physics. Yes? So if we have an electron and an electron in the second prion drop, yes. if we give the material an energy, does that mean the transfer to the electron or the... Gets to choose. There's lots of ways to distribute the energy, like in any system now. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it, c it can happen in, in different so ways. So the in the first prion draw can, uh, can also move right now, because the, there, is a, there is a surface. There is a surface. Uh, Yes, but remember that there's 10 to the 23 electrons and each of them only has one, so it's much better to think of the whole as moving yeah. rather than all 10 to the 23 electrons shifting. Yeah, yeah that's sort of the lesson, is that, is that thinking about the whole is the right way to, to, to go forward. All right. Um, by the way, um, I said earlier, everything is either a metal uh, which conducts or an insulator which doesn't, and often I've, I've given talks like this and people have thought they're clever and said, what about semiconductors? Uh, so a semiconductor um, is the same thing as an insulator. So a semiconductor is an insulator, but the energy that's required to excite these guys up to the next band is comparable to the temperature that you have in your system. In other words, KBT is similar to the energy gap, which is, is called delta. And in that case, you don't have to do very much to get these to move up to there, um, they move up to there just because they're thermally excited. And so a semiconductor, roughly speaking, is, is like this, where there's electrons moving around here and holes moving around here, but the number of them is fixed by the temperature, and as you lower the temperature, these guys um, uh, drop down to there. Okay. I, it, it's also why there's, um, uh, they have this weird property that semiconductors conduct better as you heat up the temperature. And they conduct better because as you heat up the temperature, more and more of these electrons jump up to here and then are free to conduct electricity. Whereas metals, if you heat up the temperature, a metal just shakes around a lot more and there's just lots more crap going on and they, uh, they have a higher resistivity at higher temperature. So that's the reason that that's different. All right. So this is the, the summary of our two basic uh, lectures in condensed matter physics. One, a lattice gives you gaps in the energy spectrum, or what's called band structure. And two, the Pauli exclusion principle does all the rest. And a lot of the phenomenology of metals that conduct and insulators that don't can be understood just from these two very basic facts in, in quantum mechanics. All right. How long do I have, David? 20 minutes? Really? Didn't I start? Oh, it's an hour and a quarter. OK. All right, God, I'll chat for 20 minutes. No problem. Um, OK. Um, Good. So, so that's sort of 
that, that, that's the end of the first sort of part of, the, of these lectures, when I really just wanted to tell you the basics of condensed matter physics and, uh, and some of the ideas that, that underlie it. Um, and everything I'm telling you, I've told you about was basically understood by the 1930s, um, apart from including electron interactions took place in the 1950s uh, and is actually still on, ongoing now. Um, so what I thought I'd do now is, is tell you sort of where the subject goes um, and some of the most interesting topics that are happening at the moment in condensed matter physics and why they're interesting. Um, and then in the next two lectures, I'm going to focus on one of them and try to get you up to speed on, on what I think is one of the most exciting and uh, beautiful areas in, in condensed matter physics. This might be a good place to pause for questions, though, if anyone has any, any questions at all about what we've done so far before I jump in. Please. Uh, the, the second point is here, mm. about exclusion principle. Uh, this is not just because we don't have interaction between the uh, electrons. Yeah. Uh, if there is an interaction, uh, the second point is... Yeah, although it gets replaced by... by, by something a little more complicated. But it's, it's, it, it's not like when you turn on interactions, everything goes, right? I, it, it, the Fermi surface survives, and a lot of the things that Pauli exclusion does for you still hold. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right, so I, I thought what I'd do for the last part of this lecture um, is, uh, is nothing very technical, but just, just tell you some words, some names about some of the interesting things that, that's happening at the moment um, and just tell you why I think they're interesting and, and what's going on. So I think I've got about five different things that I'm going to tell you about. It's by no means all. Like I said, this condensed matter physics is by far the biggest area in all of physics. Um, and so you know, there's an awful lot going on both experimentally and, and theoretically. Um, but yeah, let me just tell you a few that I, I think is interesting. Um, so uh, here's the first one. Um, part of condensed matter physics moved into something called atomic and molecular and optical physics, something like, okay, I don't know, various words like this. Uh, and in large part because uh, now physicists can really do precision things with individual atoms, and that sort of became interesting in, in its own right. Um, but one particularly interesting idea is, is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, have people seen this in statistical mechanics? A lot of you have. Okay. Um, I'll be brief. Um, so, so what happens is you take certain atoms that are not fermions but, but collectively are bosons. Uh, in particular, rubidium is, uh, is, is the, the typical atom. Um, and you get to cool these atoms down to very, very tiny temperatures. It's about 10 to the minus 9 Kelvin. And Einstein predicted long, long ago that they undergo a phase transition where a large fraction, an order one fraction of the atoms, all sit in the same quantum state. So it's the opposite regime from what we've been talking about with Fermi surfaces. It's now every single atom sits in the ground state. And what you get is, is a really miraculous object. You, you, you get um, a quantum object that you can more or less see with the naked eye. Okay? All of these atoms have completely lost their individual identity, and they're all just formed this one big quantum object. It's a little bit like communism. You know, it's... Um, you know, you give up the individual identity for the, the benefit of uh, the greater collective. It's just with atoms it works much better than, than with people. Um, so um, these have really wonderful properties. You, you take this little atom, um, sorry, not this atom, this condom, they typically have about 10 to the 8 atoms in, the, the, the very good ones. I should say they were first made when, 1996, something like like that, maybe 1997, sometime in the, in the late 1990s, so fairly recently. Um, Einstein predicted them, so it took 70 years to, to make these things, um, and they won the Nobel Prize very soon after. I think they won the Nobel Prize in 2002. So uh, uh, Wolfgang Ketteli, Carl Wieman, and someone else won the Nobel Prize for, for making these things. Um, and, and they have amazing properties. So, so you, you take a, a blob of this, and, um, like I say, you can just about see it with, with the naked eye. And uh, suppose you try to spin it. So you would think it would spin like a football, because it's something that you can see with, with the naked eye. But you know from quantum mechanics that it can't do that, because it's a quantum object, and it can only have integer uh, angular momentum. So its angular momentum can't be anything at all. So you can take this thing, and you can give it a knock. It just doesn't do anything. 
and you give it a slightly bigger knock and it doesn't do anything. And finally you give it enough of a knock so it spins and it spins exactly once. So this is a macroscopic object that's spinning with quantized angular momentum. And the reason you know it's spinning once is because it, it creates a single vortex that's, uh, that's sitting there. And so you keep knocking this thing and it gets spinning faster and faster and faster. And if you want to know how fast it's spinning, you take a photograph of it, literally, and you count the number of vortices that you can see inside and it will be spinning that much times h bar. That will be its, its angular momentum. So you know, all of these quantum things that we learn about happening but in... Uh, in a macroscopic object. Okay, so that, that, that's pretty wonderful. Um, another thing which um, is, is very old now, but, but superconductors, um, they were discovered by Kamalik Owens way, way back in the, the early 1900s, um, and they were understood by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer in around the 1950s. Um, and roughly speaking, what happens is, is you have this Fermi surface, and two electrons from antipodal ends of the Fermi surface get together, make themselves into a boson, and then that boson forms something like a Bose-Einstein condensate. That's a little bit simplified, but, but roughly speaking, that, that's what happens. Um, and they do wonderful things. They, they eject magnetic fields, so you can hover magnets uh, above them and just, just use these things to, um, uh, to float objects. Um, but there's a wonderful mystery here. So like I said, they were very well understood in the 1950s, but in the 1980s, uh, physicists discovered new materials that superconduct at much higher temperatures than uh, was previously known. So most of these things only go superconducting if you cool them down to roughly 10 Kelvin. Some are 20. Um, but there's a class of materials, um, in particular things called uh, uh, the, the cuprates. They have copper oxide uh, um, atoms in layers that, that go superconducting at around 60 Kelvin. And um, there's a sense in which this has been the most studied and important problem in physics for 40 years now, um, maybe 35. We still don't understand what's, what's going on. And the reason is that the interactions between these electrons are very, very strong. Um, and as I said earlier, we just don't understand things when um, interactions are, are strong. So it's really one of the big open problems in physics is why materials go superconducting at, uh, at high temperatures. Um, other cool stuff? I was originally going to give a lecture on, on graphene. I think I've, I've changed my mind, but I, I'm not entirely sure. Let, let me tell you what graphene is. It, it's a, it's a two-dimensional material that has this lattice structure. And it was made around 10 years ago, and Gaiman Novoselev won the Nobel Prize for it soon thereafter. Um, and there's various reasons to be excited about it. It's a very strong material. But as a theorist, this is why I like it. It's because this material realizes relativistic equations in the laboratory. And in particular, it realizes the Dirac equation in the laboratory. So with this material, you get to do relativistic quantum field theory at room temperature on your desktop in the laboratory. You don't need to build the LHC and uh, what's going on at CERN. You get to test things here. And so it is a calculation we could go through if you were interested, but it's a rather long calculation. You remember the tight binding model that we started with where you take an electron and, and it hops? You can do the same here. So you construct this lattice, and you do the tight binding model where you write down a Hamiltonian for the electron hopping from here to any of the, the neighboring sites. And then you just solve it. You solve it in exactly the same way we did yesterday. And what you find coming out at the end is rather miraculously the Dirac equation that Hans wrote down on, uh, in his lecture. So it's the same equation that describes relativistic electrons actually is what describes uh, electrons moving on, on this material. So it, it's a slightly miraculous calculation, but it's, um, it, it's very nice to see. If, if I, I think I probably won't do it, but if people are interested, it's, it's in full detail in the lecture notes that I, I gave the link to yesterday, just, just to go through this uh, step by step. All right. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, this is currently, um, I would say, the hottest topic in condensed matter physics. It's called topological insulators. And uh, the Nobel Prize last year was in large part given, about half of it, I think, was given for, for topological insulators. So, so let me tell you what a topological insulator is. And I might tell you more tomorrow or the, ne the next lecture. Um, an insulator, I think I've convinced you, is boring. Okay? An insulator is when electrons fill up a Brillouin zone and then they can't do anything if you try and, and, uh, and perturb them in other ways other ways. So I think for 70 decades we've thought insulators are just the most boring substances because nothing happens. And uh, about 10 years ago various people realized 
there are lots of different ways in which you can be boring. So there are, um, diff although the electrons fill out these Brillouin zones, there's different ways in which they can fill out the Brillouin zone to do with the phase of the wave function. And in particular, every single insulator can be classified as boring or not boring. And the boring ones are the things that we realized all along. And the not boring ones we call topological insulators. And what's interesting is not what's happening in the middle, but what's happening on their surface. And in particular, on the surface of topological insulators, you get, as with graphene, relativistic Dirac electrons moving uh, um, at the speed of light and obeying relativistic quantum field theory. So it's another kind of material where, um, where the Dirac equation and relativistic quantum mechanics becomes important uh, on their surface. So th this is actually an experimental um, uh, a plot of, of exactly this, in fact. This is energy. This is momentum. This is the experimental plot of a, uh, some excitation moving on the surface. But you can see what, what's happening here is, is you would expect it to be quadratic because energy is a half mv squared. And it's not. It's absolutely linear. So this is saying that energy is proportional to momentum, but this is something you've seen before. This is the energy versus momentum for a massless relativistic particle. So again, another way to get relativity, but coming out uh, on the surface of a material. Um, I, I think I might walk you through a little bit of the calculation tomorrow about, about how you do um, topological insulators. Um, and finally, the thing I'm actually going to tell you about um, tomorrow and the next day is, is something called the quantum Hall effect, um, which I think is my all-time favorite thing in, in condensed matter physics. Um, and it's the following. You take electrons and you put them on a plane and you put a magnetic field that way. And they form the most amazing uh, states of matter. In particular, you can see that in this state of matter, the objects that move around carry one-third the charge of an electron. So somehow... In, due to quantum mechanics, the electron fractionalizes into pieces, and the individual fractions of the electron are the things that, that wander around. Sometimes a third, sometimes a fifth, sometimes a seventh. Depends exactly on, on the material. So, you know, the electron is an indivisible object. There's no way you can, uh, you, you can smash it up. And yet, if you put something like uh, 100 million of them all in one place, it conspires so that it looks as if the electron fractionalizes into pieces. Um, so I think this is what I'm going to tell you about uh, this and maybe a bit of topological insulators as they're closely related. I think that's what we'll do for, for the next two lectures. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. Happy to take questions if there are any.
Lattice is every single point that you can find from. So, for example, a cubic lattice is, uh, is when you these are one, one, zero, zero. This, this is a cubic lattice. So just all the points given by this, where these are integers. There are and you can I can have different R's and I can find different. And uh, the um, Yeah. 
No, no, you, you can map one lattice to another, but you can't take, if you know the real lattice, you can write all different lattice. But there's no sense in which a point in the real lattice has a corresponds to a point in the lattice. If the whole lattice of one tells you what the whole lattice of the other is, but there's not one-to-one map between the two points. There's no relation between the two points. There's no relation between the two points. It's just the lattice. I got it. I got it.
call him out. Do you want to wait till after the lunch? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so we're very happy to listen to Anne's second lecture on cosmology. All right, how, how is the microphone? Is it working? Is it not too loud, not too soft? Okay, it is great. Okay, so <clears throat> today, today's topic is not quite, I think, so conceptually difficult. It's about dark matter. Um, and so dark matter, has been around in cosmology as a concept since the 30s. Uh, it was uh, Fritz Zwicky who first noticed in looking at um, Coma Cluster, a giant cluster of galaxies, that the Coma Cluster appears to be gravitationally bound. And you know, in gravity, you, um, you, if you have a gravitationally bound system, the kinetic energy is proportional to the potential energy. So you can look at the velocities of the galaxies and figure out from that how much total mass there is in the cluster. And the velocities of the galaxies was too high compared to the total mass in the cluster. So they, I think at that time they didn't call it the dark matter problem, but he noticed there was a problem, that there appeared to be a lot of mass in the cluster that wasn't accounted for by what you could see. And then um, Vera Rubin, who unfortunately died last year before she could get, you know, what would deservedly be a Nobel Prize for her discovery, uh, was observing uh, rotation curves of galaxies. But by that I mean you look at a distant galaxy, you look at the Doppler shift of the stars, as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy. That tells you how fast they are moving. And from that, you can tell how much mass um, is enclosed inside this. Again, this, the, things, the stars are move, moving um, faster when there is more mass. Now, you know, in our solar system, the planets, which are farther from the sun, are going slower. Um, it's based all the mass in our solar system is concentrated at the sun. And that's what we would expect to see for galaxies, too, that the stars which are farther from the center of the galaxy would be going slower. But what Vera Rubin observed is that's not true. They are going faster the farther they are from the center. And then finally, they, they pretty much level off. It's called a flat rotation curve, that the uh, stars, the stellar velocities are pretty much the same in the distant parts of the uh, galaxy. And Again, this was a puzzle, and infer from this that there should be some kind of matter that's not accounted for. 
Okay, so here's uh, the coma cluster, as, as Wiki saw. And the coma cluster, according to Zwicky, needed to have about 400 times more mass than what he could account for. Now, we know now that um, about 10 times as much mass is in gas made out of baryons, ordinary things, as in stars you can see. But that still leaves a lot of missing mass. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, so yeah, so this shows um, what we now have as our picture of a galaxy. So here you see the stars in a galaxy. That's what you see if you look through a telescope. But what you can infer based on the rotation curves and also now based on a number of other things I'm going to talk about is that this blue stuff, this is the dark matter. The dark matter extends out much farther from the center than the stars and in this picture, it's blue, but you can't actually see it. This is uh, reconstructed from a simulation. And how do we know about the dark matter? So besides these rotation curves and these galaxy velocities, we can also use gravitational lensing. So for instance, this is a picture of a gravitational lens. Now you see, this is not due to dark matter. This is some galaxy, and you see this ring around it? That ring is another galaxy that's behind the first one, and the light from the galaxy is bent by the gravity to form this ring. That's a gravitational, called a strong gravitational lens. Um, dark matter has been detected by a, several kinds of lensing. So this is looking at a, um, a distribution of simulated dots representing galaxies, and you see that they are you know, they have some shape, sort of oval round. But if there is uh, a gravitational lens in the system, this lensing warps, changes the shapes, and you see something more like this. And so statistical studies of galaxies and their shapes also can give evidence for mass that is producing gravitational lensing. And so, through detecting matter which does not shine through gravitational lensing and through these rotation curves, we've, we've, you know, we have strong reason to believe either there is dark matter or something else. For a, for a long time, people said, well, maybe there's something wrong with our theory of gravity. I mean, that's another alternative. That is called modified gravity. Um, so we could imagine the laws of gravity are dis different at large distances. And that could, that could perhaps explain some of these phenomena. Um, I don't think anyone has a good theory of how that can give the gravitational lensing results, but um, it's still an open question. So the question is, is dark matter really different from ordinary matter? I mean, we know there are a lot of varieties of ordinary matter that don't shine. I mean, clouds of hydrogen gas aren't shining the way stars are. Um, you know, could dark matter just be some form of ordinary matter that happens to uh, not be shining, or could it just be some kind of modified gravity? Well, there seems to be a real difference between the properties of dark matter and ordinary matter in collisions. So how do we collide dark matter? I mean, we, we don't even know what it is, so we don't know how to make it, and we can't collide it. But it turns out nature does this for us. What nature does sometimes, quite frequently because there's a long time and a lot of galaxies, is clusters of galaxies will pass through each other. Now, if your cluster of galaxies passes through another cluster of galaxies, nothing much happens to you. The stars are pretty not dense. They don't hit each other. But most of the mass in the galaxy is in, most of the ordinary mass is in the form of clouds of gas. And the clouds of gas, as they pass through each other, do collide and interact. So this shows a picture of two galaxies that have collided. One of them went this way and one of them went that way. Now the pink shows the gas in the galaxy, which they can detect because it does go into, does get excited by thermal radiation and then de-excites. So they can tell that the gas is here. The blue um, is inferred by looking, you see the galaxies behind there? By studying the shapes of the galaxies behind there, they can infer there is a big gravitational lens 
due to matter. And where that gravitational lens is is where the blue is. And it's not actually blue. This is, the blue is just colored in by computer to show where the mass that's doing the gravitational lensing is. So you see the two galaxies collided, and the blue is where most of their mass is. But the red is where most of the mass that's in ordinary gas is. So the collision separated the most of the matter from the ordinary matter. So the collisional properties of the matter that makes up most of the galaxy is different from the collisional properties of ordinary matter. It's not ordinary. We don't know what it is, but it's not ordinary stuff. And I have not heard any reasonable discussion of how this could happen with just modified gravity. Because modified gravity would say the gravity, whatever it's doing, would follow where the mass is. The mass is where the pink is. The ordinary particles are where the pink is, but the gravitational lensing is being done by that blue. And there are a lot of these colliding galaxy clusters. The bullet cluster is the most famous. It looks kind of like the speeding bullet. This one's called the train wreck. I just fill up with some pictures, right? If you talk about cosmology, you should show some pictures. Again, you always see that the pink is part of the gas that collided. It got stuck in the center. It got slowed down by colliding, and the blue is where the mass is. So indeed, you know, we are quite sure there is dark matter. Um, something which is gravitating, it lenses like matter. It is collisionless, as far as we can tell. At least it doesn't collide as much as ordinary matter does. It um, is therefore not made of atoms. It seems to be something which is, in fact, completely beyond our standard model of particle physics. Um, and the only access we have to it, um, the only way we can see it right now, the portal, if you like, is gravity. Everything we know about it, we know from gravity. And we would like to find some other way of studying the dark matter, if, if there is one. And one thing we would guess about it, the dark matter, and I'll explain what the duck is in a minute, um, is that, OK, so we know it's some stuff that doesn't gravitate. It seems to be uh, pressureless. Uh, it has um, the same properties as a collection of cold particles would have. Now, there's a theorem, which I would call the duck theorem, which we often invoke when we need to, which is if something quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, we call it a duck, OK? So the dark matter um, walks and quacks like a collection of particles that are massive and cold. So we'll assume that's what it is. And so it's already, if you like, I hear I've listed a lot of ways. It's been discovered. We see its effects in galaxy clusters, the dynamics of the galaxies. We see its effects in the galaxies, the dynamics of the stars. We see its effects through gravitational lensing, both the weak lensing that produces just little distortions of the shapes of galaxies and the strong lensing that produces the big rings. Uh, we see um, its effects on the gas in the clusters. We see the dark matter gets separated from the gas in the clusters in the bullet cluster. Um, we can trace what it's doing in a variety of ways. We even can infer from our theory of how the cosmic microwave background fluctuation pattern works that there must have been dark matter back then. So, we've just, so now what we want to do is somehow identify it. We want a, a theory for it that's a little bit deeper than some stuff that has no pressure and gravitates. And let's see, what this is showing in this graph. So I talked yesterday about the uh, critical uh, density. Um, so the critical density called omega for a flat universe. And, the uni and our universe seems to be flat and therefore have critical energy density. And then this omega sub m is the fraction of the critical density which is made out of matter. And this is generally written in terms of 
just a pure number. So this plot here shows, you know, by putting all these things that are observed about dark matter together, we, um, whoops. Okay, so on the horizontal axis is this omega matter, so this would be no, none of the universe is matter. 0.6 would be 60% of the universe is matter. And then um, on the vertical axis, this is, uh, in order to sort of use all these facts, we also need a uh, theory about what the rest of the universe is. We assume most of the universe that isn't matter is dark energy. And the equation of state uh, parameter of dark energy, um, if it was vacuum, it would be minus one, but this is putting in it as a free parameter, how much negative pressure there is. And then we take all these eight things, each of them corresponding to a colored blob, and we get a consistent picture which has 30% of the energy density of the universe dark matter, and um, equation of state parameter for the dark energy minus one. And, okay, so this thing, baryons, this is uh, the fraction of the matter which is in ordinary uh, atoms, made, which are made out of baryons, and that's about um, one-sixth of the total matter. So there's about five times as much dark matter as ordinary matter, and then about um, two and a half times as much dark energy as dark matter. So this is our picture articles and our wonderful theories of physics beyond the standard model, which have wonderful names like Axion and WIMP, which I'm going to talk about today. These exist so far only on theory papers or, you know, figments of our imagination, but we don't, we, we have reasons to think they might be real. It's a gravitational effect, and it could be almost anything except what we already know about. And a few things, we know it should be something that has no pressure and doesn't collide the way ordinary matter is. Um, it doesn't interact with light, at least not as far as we can tell, so it shouldn't have electric charge. Um, and it shouldn't, we think it's, there are arguments that it shouldn't have strong interactions either. Um, so questions at this point? Is this, yes? Uh, what did the article say? It was so this is the history of... is weak. I mean, it's circumstantial. Um, but we don't know what else it could be. So, yeah. Yeah? What is there other than a exactly. What is there other than a particle that it could be? Uh, it could be a... It, okay, so some, some people... Are So, right, this is entirely astrophysics. We have not a clue in any of our particle physics experiments that would...